Okay, so Be'ezra Sashem, tonight we're going to be continuing with our series of Shirim on Rabbi Nachman and the possibility of joy. And what we're going to be speaking about tonight, like all other weeks, is going to be a continuation of the previous Shlavim or steps in the process. Last week we spoke about how for Rabbi Nachman, one of the essential tools towards fighting for happiness in this world once we've made the decision to learn how to stop caring about what the outside world has to say, once we've embraced the silliness of the world, not the late sunness, but the silliness of the world and the capacity to laugh at existence, to laugh at the fact that concealment appears to be real, we have the ability to then focus in on our thoughts, to choose to think positively, to compel our minds to think what we want them to think and to stay away from uncomfortable thoughts. And for Rabbi Nachman, it was a simple cognitive law that the human being has bechira at every moment over what they choose to think about. And that the only freedom or the only possibility of freedom in this world, the only possibility of authentic joy is a joy that exists within the mind itself. As we said, Rabbi Nachman quotes numerous times from the Pasuk of Iov, that that so too it turns out that there's a spirit that moves within man and it's the wisdom of God, the breath of God that gives understanding that even our thoughts, the thoughts that we think, the contemplative experiences that we have and the framing and the contextualization of human experience that we engage in is also the breath of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And when we're capable of understanding that the Ikr Nekuda of Bechira is how we choose to think about a given situation, so then we have the capacity to compel ourselves to joy. Again, highlighting the fact that ultimately this worldliness is something that fights against the possibility of joy, joy which is built on a sense of wholeness. But the secret of joy or the possibility of joy is grabbing hold of a future wholeness that is not yet present and drawing it into the present moment. So it's living a future in the present, even though that future has not yet arrived. On a similar vein, we discussed in one of the shirim on the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh, and the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh's connection to Yitzchak. We also saw that this was Makusher to the Arizal, whose name was Yitzchak, as well as to Rabbi Nachman, who, as we saw in his pathway towards Eretz Yisrael, decided that he wanted to be called Yitzchak. And the Chassid came to Rabbi Nassim, asking him who he should name his son after, his grandfather, whose name was Yitzchak, or Rabbi Nachman himself, and Rabbi Nassim said, name him Yitzchak, because in that way, he's also going to be named Rabbi Nachman. So all of these tzaddikim have a hiskashras to the Bechina of Yitzchak. And as we saw, the idea of Yitzchak is fighting for joy in a world where there seems to be things that are difficult. Fighting for joy in a world where the opposite is present. And the Baal Shem Tov teaches us over and over that in the place that a person chooses to think, that's where the person finds themselves. The Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh let us in on a joke. He let us in on the silliness of being. HaKadosh Baruch Hu created a world that appears to be concealed. A world where darkness and constriction and difficulty and concealment on a collective and individual level appear to be the main mode of experience in this world. Because Tzimtzum and Hashem's constriction and contraction of himself, so to speak. Yet on the other hand, as Rabbi Nachman makes very clear to us, the secret of Jewish amuna of faith, is that even though there appears to be concealment and constriction, we know that there's really no concealment or constriction, that even the concealment and the constriction of HaKadosh Baruch Hu is just another way of HaKadosh Baruch Hu expressing himself, as Rabbi Nachman teaches in the 64th teaching in Bayel Paro. And so here's the joke, here's the antinomy, here's the, the, the ludicrous nature of existence. On the one hand, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is utterly concealed. On the other hand, HaKadosh Baruch Hu's concealment is an utter impossibility. So this is the joke. This is the joke of human experience. This is the joke of the reality that we find ourselves in. Experiencing concealment when the teller of the joke, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, knows that it's not really concealment. Comes along the Baal Shem Tov and all of the tzaddikim ha'amitim, and they let us in on the punchline of the joke. They tell us that, Chevra, in truth, concealment is not real. The more you contemplate concealment, the more you gaze deeply into the very DNA of concealment, you'll come to find that it's nothing but the expression of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And so the Baal Shem Tov tells us the punchline that there is no Hester and Les Aser Panimine, and that as long as I'm aware that the Alufa Shal Olam is found in every place in my life, so then HaKadosh Baruch Hu is there. 
The only problem is that the joke's not over yet. The joke's not over yet. The joke ends when history ends. The joke ends when Mashiach arrives. And then we can say, We can laugh at the punchline when it's revealed that in truth, all of the concealment and the Hester and the Hastar Shabbatay Hastara and the Chayshach, HaKafel and Mechupel, and Oyle Mazah HaNosin Bebetan Shalanachash, as the Rashash says, this world that finds itself buried within the belly of the snake, it will be revealed in the future of Anahapechu. It will be revealed that in truth the concealment was the very sight of a Kaddish Baruch Hu's disclosure. But what about those of us who have tasted the light of the Yitzchayim, who tasted from the deep well of the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh and the Nachal Nevea HaMakor Chachma, that spring of irrigating waters that descends from Chachma itself? What about us who know the punchline of the joke? We already know, even before the joke is over, what the joke is going to be. We know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is behind all of the concealment. And that's the taste of Elam Haba and Elam Haza. That's the ability to draw down that future fullness even into the place of Chisaron, which is the capacity of finding joy even in a place of sadness. As Rabbi Nachman tells us in the Hakdama to the Mice of Shiva Habat Larim, that it's a story that will teach us how to find joy and how they once found joy specifically out of the Marash Chayra. Because the biggest joke in the world is to come to terms with the fact that even when I'm in the Marash Chayra, even when I'm in the opposite of joy, I have the ability to compel myself to joy. And so the entire possibility of joy is to understand that we know the punchline of the joke. We know the v'tisvak leom acharon even before the end of the tale is told. And on a certain level, one can apply this type of understanding to the maisim, to the sipori maisios of Rabbi Nachman, the sipori maisios meshanim kanmonios, the sipori maisios of atik yoyim and of ancient days. Tales that are so ancient that it's almost as if they're rooted in the future and tales that are so futuristic that it's as if they were rooted in the past. That so many of the tales of Rabbi Nachman of the Supreme Maisios are without ending. There's no Maisa of Elosiyem. He didn't finish. He didn't tell us how the lost princess was saved. He doesn't tell us about the seventh legless beggar and his arrival to the children who are married in the pit, dug into the mud, carried, covered over by dust and garbage. He doesn't tell us any of this. But on a certain level, as Rav Yitzhak Maya Morgenstern Shlita points out, the lack of the ending itself in Rabbeinu's tales is the very ending that we're trying to understand. That we don't need the end to arrive in order for us to taste the ending. We can taste the ending even prior to the end arriving. And so even though V'tishak Leom Macharon, we're told that that laughter at the end of the joke of the dialectical sway between concealment and revelation that is existence, even though the joke is not finished yet, and the storyteller has not finished the story. The tale is not told over yet. Nevertheless, we have the ability to laugh at the joke prior to the punchline. We have the ability to look at a Kaddish Baruch Hu and say, I-, I get it. I know the joke is not over. I know we're still in the Hester. But nevertheless, I understand that eventually this Hester is going to be transformed into a site of Gilui. And it's that Inyan of Yesh Inyan Shiyatapecha called this transformative way of thinking, of realizing that even though the future has not yet arrived yet, that doesn't mean I can't live within the future in the present moment. On the Bechina of Elamecha Tirabachayecha, of tasting Shabbos in the six days of the week, of tasting light within darkness itself, that's the secret of the Machshavos Tovos. That's the secret of the ability to choose how I would like to think in any given moment. As we said, Rabbi Nachman points out, in the future, we're going to be told that tzaddikim yoishvim ve'etroseihem biroishehem, that the tzaddikim are going to sit with their crowns in their head. And Rabbeinu asks the question, shouldn't it be their crowns upon their head? Why does it mean the crowns within their head? But that's the Indian, that in truth, Oilam Haba is found within the mind of the individual themselves. Arkadekach, that a person can be sitting in a room full of people who are brokenhearted, with darkness everywhere, with clouds of storms so- covering them, and a person with the proper mindset, with the proper alignment of the heart, can live a, a, a nukuda of geula, a nukuda of simcha, in the bechina of kibbutz simcha teitzeu, that joy itself is what drags us out of galus. What we're going to talk about tonight with regards to the eitzos, the eitzos apshutos, that Rabbeinu offers us in terms of how to cultivate joy in a world that seems to be the very opposite of the possibility of joy, we're going to try and see how this demand to stop caring, to reach that darga of lo yechpat chlal, to reach that darga of echad haya avram, to reach that level of being the only person in the world with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, 
and engaging in mile deshtusa and willing to look like a fool and willing to look as if we don't know anything, pretending that our water is wine, pretending that our stale bread is meat, like the tam and the mice of the chacham and the tam. We're going to see how Rabbeinu gives us insight into how to do this. Because one of the elements that human beings live most stuck in, and one of the contexts that frame human experience more than anything else is the concept of time, is the stuckness that we have being stuck within the triadic temporal sway that constitutes human experience, past, present, and future. Now the Vilna Gon already and the Tzadikim point out that time is a, is a nivra, time is a construct. Time is not an ontological reality, it's not an essential quality, but rather it's something that exists within the world. As Rabbi Nachman points out very clearly in the 66th teaching in the first volume of Lukut Maran, that Kodem Briyasa Olam, that before the creation of the world, before the creation of tam, time, everything existed at the same moment without blocking out other elements. A and B were able to operate in unison without any distortion being caused through the opposition of A to B. Things were capable of operating in that promise of shalom and that das of shalom, that equalizing, unifying, synthesizing knowledge that will be revealed when all opposites are shown to be dancing together to reveal something greater than themselves. But with the creation of time and the transmission and the process from one thing to another, we see that koyach and poyel, A and B, there's distinction and distortion between them. A says one thing, B says the other thing, and because they operate no longer on a simultaneous level, they're at war with one another. And machlokas, and distortion between one thing and its other and the boundaries of one thing next to their neighbor become the guiding principle of this world. Machlokas, distortion and frustration and infighting between one thing and another. All of that is a product of time. All of that is the fact that ein lecha davar she'ein lo zman. There's nothing in the world that doesn't have a time and nothing in the world that doesn't have a place, which means that when one thing is present, the other thing can't be present. When I'm here, I can't be there. And when I'm there, I can't be here. When it's one, it can't be two. And when it's two, it can't be one. That's the metzias of this world. Zman as the precondition of human experience, as we've spoken about in numerous of our shirim on the concept of anxiety, is always already being caught up in the concept of being late to something, of tarrying, of having missed out on something, of living our lives through the lens of after that which has happened took place. What took place? We don't know what took place. We just know that we missed it. We know that we're late in our arrival. We know that there's something that took place that was essential to us, but we missed it. We know that we have to run somewhere else. Zman is also the language of Zeman, of being called somewhere, of an appointment of sorts. This idea that I need to be somewhere, I'm late, I'm late for a very important date and I need to run and rush until I can get there and then, oh, I'm disappointed, the appointment has not lasted. That's the condition of Zman. The condition of Zman is being caught up in always already being late or just being too early, where a human being can never quite find themselves in the place that they would like to be in. That's the concept of Zman, of past, present, and future. When we go a little bit deeper into the concept of time, what we understand is that both the past and the future are the ground in which the conditions of sadness and anxiety are born. When I spend too much time contemplating the past, looking at things that have passed away, looking at things that haunt me in spite of the fact that they're dead, the ghosts continue to haunt me, the phantoms of the past over lost opportunities, missed opportunities, lost time, those things haunt me, constantly whispering in the ears of the individual, perhaps if things were different, if you had done things differently, maybe things would be different, maybe all would not have been lost. And then when the overwhelming awareness of the past becomes too strong, we redirect ourselves to the future where anxiety is born, where the unknown beckons the mind to anticipate that which is overwhelming. What will be, I have no idea. All I know with certainty is that it will be overwhelming. And it's the anticipatory dread that we have over things dying, over things being lost, over the shortness of our time. Time becomes the precondition in which human beings feel that constriction 
we're born into Zman and we live under the threat of Zman swallowing us whole. And Rabbi Nachman was very well aware of this fact. Rabbi Nachman was very well aware of the fact that when a human being lives in the duration of time, in the feeling of time, duration is the human experience of the lengthiness of time when each moment is spread thinner and thinner to make life go slower and slower where a person is experiencing every single moment as if it's this drudging along process of a past that leads to a present that's leading to a future the more we feel time the more pain we're aware of time itself is the birthplace of a fallen human consciousness as we've spoken about so often when it comes to the birthplace of Torah Shabal Peh. Torah Shabal Peh, the oral Torah, which is almost this secondary consolation prize due to the loss of Torah Shabal In Torah Shabal we don't encounter so much the concept of time. It's a statement of fact. The world was created. When, how, it doesn't matter. It's a statement of fact. But when we fall away from Torah Shabbat through the chayt of the Eitzadas Tevera, through the sin of Moshe Rabbeinu hitting the stone instead of speaking to the stone, from which the concept of Torah Shabbat Peh originates, what we find is we find ourselves in a fallen reality where things are no longer clear in their pristine nature and presence, but rather things pass away and other things take their place and we're stuck and caught between the past which forces us downwards into that grave of lost memories and the future which drags us forward into that anticipatory space of anxiety, which is why Torah Peh, as the Tikkun Zohar points out, and Rabbi Nachman points out as well, the Shisha Sidre Mishnah, the six tractates of Mishnah, the acronym for them is Zman Nakat. It means that time has taken place that the entire edifice of Torah Shabal Peh is already living within the confines of time, where a human being is susceptible to failure and questioning and doubtful realities, where clarity is rare, like the Talmud and the Gemara. And the first question, the first Mishnah that we open up with in Maseches Brachos is, Me'ei From when do I read Kriyat Shema Ba'arvis? It's a question of time. It's a question of, is now the right time? Is now the right time? No, perhaps later is the better. Perhaps earlier was better. As we described in the Shir on Laha Tacherif and Sapechas in the series of the inner world of anxiety. Now, we know the teaching from the Said Yasharim, which we've seen over and over, that Me'emasai Korin is Shema Be'aravis. From when do I read Shema at nighttime? That instead of reading the word Me'emasai as from when, we can read the word me'emasai as me'emasi, from my fear, from my anxiety, from my existential stuckness and livedness in this world is what propels me to read Kriyat Shema. That Torah Shabbat Peh is a response to the human anxiety that is born out of time, that is born out of the sense of always being late, of always needing to do more and looking into the future and feeling that time is simply too long. Baruch Hashem, I was to find another Makor in a story with the Rebbe of Zushya, that the Rebbe of Zushya came to one of his Rebbeim, Rav Shmuel Shmelka of Nicholsburg, and he begged him to teach him Torah Shabbat Peh. He begged him to learn Gemara with him. And they started learning. Rav Shmuel Shmelka agreed to learn. And they sat down and they started learning the first mission in Masechus Brachos. And Rav Shmuel Shmelka said, From when do we read Kriyat Shema Arvis? And Rav Zushya said, Why can't we read it as Me'emasi Karin Shema Arvis? From the existential dread that I experience of the possibility of living in a world without godliness, that's what compels me to declare the faith that I have in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And what Shmuel Shmelka said to Rav Zushia, which is perhaps more instructive than the story itself, is he closed the Gemara and he said, if you want to learn Zushia's Torah, then go learn Zushia's Torah. If you want to learn with me, then we can go further. But nevertheless, we see a support from Rabbi Rav Zushia that Me'em Masai, the concept of time, is always already interconnected with the concept of anxiety, with fear over lost opportunities, and the duration and the lengthiness through which time will carry us. And Rabbi Nachman was fully aware of this. Rabbi Nachman was dreadfully aware of the fact that being stuck in time consciousness forces a person in two directions. 
on the one hand, it can force us into a state of despondency and yeyush and loss of hope over where we have fallen. It's always in past tense. I have fallen already to the place that I've fallen in. Ayyad Achman was keenly aware, as we understand from hundreds of places in his writings, that there's a tendency that when a person falls to the place that they have fallen, to give up hope, to feel that they can't drag themselves out of there, God forbid. So that's the danger of the past. The danger of the past is that I'm stuck where I'm stuck, and I am who I am, and I am incapable of change. But Rabbi Nachman was also keenly aware of a futuristic form of anxiety that emerges from time. And that is the idea that even if I put in my effort right now, even if I strengthen myself and I gird myself to center my mind and to recognize that I can choose how I would like to think at this given moment, that I can choose joy out of darkness, even if that's the case, what about the next moment? And what about the next moment? And what about the moment after that? Even if I could be misgaber, even if I could overcome myself and overcome my limitations and force myself and compel myself and throw myself with abandonment and surrender into the space of Kedusha and choose to encounter Hashem in my life at this moment, there's going to be another moment where I have to do that. And another moment and another moment and another moment. And all of those moments spread themselves out to the point that time feels unending. And it feels like the burdensome task of serving God is going to be prolonged and it's going to be such a burden that I'm eventually going to lose hope. I'm not able to carry this burden for that long. I'm not able to be attentive for this long. I'm not able to withdraw from this particular behavior for that long. I'm not able to be mindful for that long. That's the fear that Rabbi Nachman was very well aware of. What happens when a person decides to throw themselves with abandonment into avoda? to stop caring about the world, to be silly with the world and act as a shaita with mile dishtusa and to choose to find the light of God in my mind. I can do that for a moment, but what about all of the infinite future moments? When I think about the future, I can't do that. Rabbi Nachman was very well aware of that. And so what we want to understand prior to going into the particular etzah that Rabbeinu offers us is that Rabbi Nachman understood that the more we encounter time, the longer time feels, on a certain level, the lower our spiritual awareness is at that moment. That the higher our understanding, the higher our mode of conscious awareness of godliness and purpose in this world, the less duration will be felt. Time will fly by. Things will feel more compact. Things will progress smoothly as if all that exists is this present moment in front of me. But the lower I am, the more dragged out time is. The more despondent I am, the longer the day feels. Almost like the second hand is moving extra slow or not even moving whatsoever. Stuck in that slow sludging movement of time. But the more spiritually aware I am, the more time quickens itself the less difficult the burden of time feels. Rabbi Nachman in the 61st teaching in the Kutim Maharan Chilak Beis has an incredible, incredible teaching where he describes how God, so to speak, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, is above time and space. And after stating that this is an impossible concept to understand, Rabbi Nachman continues to describe how according to the spiritual alignment that a person has in their mind at that given moment, is going to be their experience of time. The lower I am to the ground, the more elongated experience is going to feel, and the more burdensome the choice of following through with my behavior of holiness is going to feel. It's going to feel impossible. It's going to feel as if it's going to take an eternity for me to continue. But the more I cultivate spiritual awareness, the quicker time seems to go. And vice versa, the burden of avoida is going to seem like it's lighter. Rabbi Nachman gives the example how when a person is a state of unconscious slumber, representative of a state of meichin dekatness, of constricted consciousness, where all that exists is dimyon, I can have a dream that lasts 15 minutes, and I can feel as if I have lived 70 years. Because in that lowly state of consciousness, even a small amount of time, like 15 minutes, 
feels like it lasts 70 years. And 70 years is a burden. 15 minutes is okay to take on for myself, but 70 years of doing this, 70 years of choosing to be mindful, that feels very difficult. But when a person wakes up and they regain their conscious awareness, what they come to recognize is that, wow, in truth, it was only 15 minutes. I thought it was 70 years and it was only 15 minutes, symbolizing the fact that the more awareness we have, the more conscious awareness we have, the less duration there is and the less burdensome the task of serving God is. And the Nachman goes on to say that just as our relationship with dream time goes in accordance with this model, that a dream feels like it's 70 years, even though in wakefulness it's real, realistically 15 minutes, so too with regards to the dargos and the levels that a person ascends in spiritual awareness, that what we experience as an actual 70 years, if we were to ascend to a higher level of consciousness, time would feel tighter, time would feel more quick and the duration and the burden and the anxiety producing process of time from past to present to future would feel less exhausting, would feel less burdensome. And on and on and on, according to the spiritual gradations that a person can climb to the point that you can have a person who is spiritually refined enough that their entire life, their entire experience in life feels like a kaharafayan. It feels like it was just the blink of an eye. Now this idea that the higher we go or the more present we are in our lives, the less time bothers us is something that Rabbeinu describes explicitly in the Maisa Meshiva Habat Larim, in the tale of the seven beggars, in particular with the first beggar, the, the, the Kabtsan Ha'iver, the blind beggar, the blind beggar who finds these young children orphaned and alone in the forest, begging for food, caught up in their exhaustion, caught up in that fear of time, caught up in that loss of meaning. The blind beggar says, here I am, I'm going to give you bread. You thought I was blind, says the blind beggar at the hasana of those young children. You thought I was blind. You thought I couldn't see. I'm not blind at all. In fact, I see so much that it's as if I can't see. And this world moves so quickly before me like Kaharafayan that there's nothing that appears before my eyes. And it was this blind beggar, we're told, in the Sipur, that he was the youngest possible beggar and he remembered the most, which the Sadiqim and Rav Avram ben Rav Nachman points out as a paradox in terms. How could he be the youngest yet have the deepest memory? The memory of nothing, the memory of back before anything ever took place. And the answer is based on exactly what we're describing, <laughs> that the loftier a person ascends on the rungs of spiritual growth, the less time time takes the less duration causes pain, the less aware we are of the transition from one moment to another, and all of life appears to be simply a singular moment. That in this moment itself, everything is here. I don't have to worry about the past. I don't have to worry about the future. And with this understanding, with this teaching, we can understand a little bit of the etza that Rabbi Nachman gives us. Because Rabbi Nachman tells us in a, in, a, in a profound teaching, in the 59th teaching, again, two teachings away from the teaching we just reviewed, in the 59th teaching, in the second volume of Lakutim Aran, Rabbi Nachman discusses a statement of Chazal in Psachim on Daf Nun Amid Beis. And again, like Rav Sadov teaches us that if you want to understand a statement in Chazal, you have to look at the Masechta that it's found in. Because of the omni significance of Torah Shabbat Peh, the Masechtos are in line with the content of the Masechta, so that it's connected to the very idea that's being expressed. So here we have the 50th daf of Psachim, and we know that Yetzias Mitzrayim, which was a Yetzia, a freedom from time, a freedom from time through the act of Zrizus, through running forward with alacrity and not allowing time to bog us down. And here on the ninth daf, of, on the 50th daf of Psachim, we have this teaching. Now, 50 gates of Bina are where the Yitzia from Mitzrayim comes from. So the 50th daf in Masechah's Psachim, which is connected to the Nun Shari Bina, which bring about Geula, speak about the very Nekuda of time 
and our awareness of time. The Gemara says as follows, Yesh Zaruz Veniskar, Zaruz Venifsad. There is someone who moves very quickly and gains as a result of that. And there is someone who moves very quickly and loses as the result of that. And this is going to qualify what Rabbi Nachman just taught us. Because as we saw, Rabbi Nachman is teaching us that the less time takes in our life, the less we're aware of the durational process of time, the more presence we can find with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The less overwhelming our tasks will be, the less difficult it will be to serve Hashem. And on Torah Nun Tess, Rabbi Nachman says as follows. Rabbi Nachman says that in truth, schar mitzvah mitzvah. When a person performs a positive activity, when a person is aware of God in their lives, so the next moment is also going to be godly awareness. That spirituality breeds more spirituality and awareness breeds more awareness. But Rabbi Nachman says, simultaneity is an impossibility in this world. Two moments cannot take place at the same exact time. As a product of the symptom, as a product of living in a world of concealment, like we said, two things cannot take place at once. And therefore, no matter how speedy the transition from one positive thought to another positive thought, there will always be an in-between. There will always be a liminal space, an in-between space that exists between the end of the previous moment or the end of the previous mitzvah and the beginning of the next moment or the beginning of the next mitzvah. This is what Rabbi Nachman describes as zman habain, the time in-between. That no matter how speedy and fast and quick a person is in their spiritual awareness and their spiritual activity, nevertheless, there will always be an in-between space which is devoid of a mitzvah. And Rabbi Nachman says that obviously there's nothing that exists in this world without a purpose of service of God. And therefore, even this in-between time, this time that exists without command, this time that exists without a light of its own, can be utilized by righteous individuals as a form of service of God. So, yesh zariz v'nifsad. There are those, the righteous, who speed things up and move very, very quickly, and they lose out. Because by jumping from one thing to another, from one mitzvah to another mitzvah, and not allowing time to take its time, they lose out on the possibility of uncovering godliness within that in-between time. But for us, Rabbi Nachman says, for those of us who are not tzaddikim, for those of us who struggle in this world, yesh zariz v'niskar, the speediness through which we encounter life, the speed through which we move from one moment to another, without willingness to pay attention to the duration, without willingness to take an account of how long things actually should take, we gain. Because if we were to get stuck in that in-between time, we were to get stuck in that waiting place, we were to get stuck in that stretched out, elongated, durational process between moment to moment, we would lose ourselves out of fear and anxiety over how long things actually take. And therefore, yesh zariz v'niskar, there are those who speed things up and jump from one mitzvah to another, one moment of spiritual awareness to another, without allowing ourselves to take into consideration that there's a time in between. And our avoda, Rabbi Nachman says, is to jump, is to leap across that empty time across that zman habenim, across that time that is devoid of value. Because for us, that's going to be despondency. The more we're aware of time, the more stuck we get. And therefore, our job is to be medalig, is to leap across those empty pockets of time so that duration doesn't feel so strong. Parenthetically, there's a maisa that was given over by Rabbi Nachman, which is called Iger Gesprangen. I leaped. I leaped. I took a leap. Rabbi Nachman says as follows, there was a certain Litvish at Tzaddik who told me prior to his death, or Rabbi Nachman heard this, that he hit his finger on the table the way that the world hits their finger on the table when they're dancing. The Amar Besimcha Bezahalashon, and this Tzaddik who was about to die, said in this language, Iger Gesprangen, Iber Gesprangen, I leaped across life. I leaped across time, dilagti, I skipped time. Kleimar, what does this mean, Rabbi Nachman says? He was joyous about the fact that he had sprung beyond this worldliness. Again, clearly because he wasn't capable of experiencing duration. 
V'haya Rabbeinu mishabeach me'oyed as a tzaddik hazeh. Rabbeinu praised the tzaddik very much. Zazach aloymer kein koydem oiso. That he merited to say this before his life. Ashrei mi shemadalig v'koyfetz at hevle oylem hazeh v'toyosem. Praiseworthy is he who is capable of jumping across the foolishness and the emptiness of this world and its time. So we see that even though there's a certain darga where a person can prolong time, where a person can experience duration and serve God that way, nevertheless, for most of us, our avoda is to rush. Our avoda is to move from one moment to the next and collapse time and realize that the service of God does not need to be too long, but rather the service of God is something that takes place moment to moment, and each moment is a world unto itself. With those haftamos, we're ready to see and taste the medicine that Rabbeinu offers us. Now there are certain teachings, all of the teachings in Rabbeinu's writings are medicine. As he himself said, that there comes a time where a person is so sick that you have to pour barrels and barrels and barrels of medicine upon them in the hopes that perhaps one drop will fall into the mouth of the sick individual. And as Rabbi Nassim writes in a letter to his son, Rabbi Yitzchak, in Alim Litrufa, Ashrenu Shiesh Lanu Rofe Kazeh. Praiseworthy are we that we have a doctor like this because the teachings of Rabbi Nachman are medicine for us. But then there are certain forms of medicine within the general forms of medicine, which are stronger than most. And the Torah that we're about to look at is one of those forms of medicine. We're going to look at Torah Reish Ayin Beis, 272 in the first volume of Lakuta Maharan, which is known as the Torah of Ayin Reish Beis, of Arev Avdecha Latov that you should enjoin your servant for goodness. And this is a teaching that will make very clear how it's possible to serve God in this world without the anxiety over time, without the overwhelming feeling that things will take too long, without the overwhelming feeling that this task is too unbearable. Rabbi Nachman says as follows, based on the Pasuk Hayom in Bekolo Tishma'u, today, if you hear my voice, this is a tremendous principle in the service of God. That a person should not place in front of themselves anything except for that present day. With regards to work and the needs that a person has. There is a necessity, it's not just a suggestion, it's a demand, that a person not place in front of their eyes anything but this present day, this 24-hour period, this concept of bite-sized manageable pieces of time. Kemuva besvarim, as it's expressed in the books. V'chein ba'avedasi yisparach. And so too with regards to spiritual service of God. Lo yasim leneged einav ki im oso hayom. That when it comes to the service of God, a person should not place anything but that day in front of themselves. Va'oso hasha'a. And furthermore, nothing but that present moment. Ki When a person desires to enter into the service of God, to fight for joy in this world, to be mindfully aware of the power of my thoughts, to no longer care about the rest of the world, to dance even though there's no music, to make a wedding dug into the pit of the mud, to understand that even though this world appears to be hell, nevertheless, we can find the Simcha G'dayla here, that only when a person places one moment in front of them are they capable of entering into the service of God. Because when a person enters into the service of God, it appears to that individual as if it's a tremendous burden and baggage that is far too hard to carry. And a person is incapable of carrying baggage this heavy. But when a person is aware of the fact that they have nothing but that day, it's not going to be a burden whatsoever. And I'm also not going to engage in procrastination. Procrastination, which is opposite from laziness. Laziness is a gift. Laziness is that task is very simple. I just don't want to do it. Procrastination is the fear of engaging with that task. I really want to do it. I'm just afraid to do it. But when I am able to place in front of myself this day alone, then I won't push things off. I won't procrastinate from one day to another saying maybe tomorrow I'll serve God because all that exists is right now. 
because the individual has absolutely nothing other than the present moment that they find themselves in, because because tomorrow is a new reality. You want to know how to serve God? Focus only on today, specifically today. Rabbi Nachman says elsewhere that there's no rega in existence that is not its own mitzvah, its own existence. All that exists is the present moment. The past is nothing. The future is nothing. Neither of them exist. The only time that a person has to try and align their mind and fight for simcha is this moment right in front of me right now. And when a person learns to cultivate that awareness that all that exists in front of me is right now, and I don't have to worry about what's going to be in the future. I'm not in control of it anyway. I don't have to worry about what happened in the past. It's nothing anymore. At that moment, a person is capable of entering into the gates of Kedusha. At that moment, a person is capable of burdening themselves with the task of being mindfully aware of the fact that absolutely nothing matters other than the alignment of my mind with a Kaddish Baruch in that moment. And that's the birthplace of joy. That's the way we fight against anxiety and depression by denying the fact that the past or the future exists and being machadesh ourselves and renewing ourselves a thousand times, million times a day. And Be'ezra Sashem, with this Eitzah Ru'uya of Rabbi Nachman, of not looking at anything but the present moment in front of us, will be Zoha next week, Be'ezra Sashem, to complete our series of Shirim with the Torah of Reish Pei Beis, of the Eitzah Tova, of refusing to see anything but goodness in our lives, denying negativity, and with those tools, hopefully we'll be armed with the ability to fight for simcha in a world where simcha appears to be so remarkably difficult.